Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank very much uh, Cradle People, uh, which is a great name for an organization, uh, for inviting me to come uh, to your great city. It's my first time in Copenhagen, and my first time in Denmark. So I appreciate the uh, generous invitation. And uh, let's see. Oh, we're in the wrong place. All right, let's get this one. There we go. Um, so that was a, a great introduction about why, uh, why is there a waste? And you heard uh, this framework of the, uh, the economy that we're in, the challenge that we have, and all those different crises actually, uh, what's, what's beautiful is that they, con they converge in a way that zero waste can help address. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our story in San Francisco. I uh, have a number of slides, and then we'll have a chance for uh, conversation. Uh, I'll say that I've been working in San Francisco for over 19 years, and uh, helped kind of develop the programs we have and lead us towards our zero waste uh, program and vision. Uh, before that, I was working on the east coast of the U.S. And helped develop and direct a statewide composting program. So I came to San Francisco with the vision, uh, actually inspired by what I saw in Europe with uh, food composting in places like Germany, and the, uh, the possibilities of recovering all the value we have in organics and other materials. But zero waste is really about recognizing the inherent value, the resources that we have, uh, that we're discarding. Uh, waste is such a funny name, because it's, the problem is that we think of discarded materials as waste, and really waste should be considered a verb, not a noun. So waste is, it's only waste when we are wasting it. So the idea of zero waste is let's not waste the resources. So, a little bit of San Francisco, I'm sure, you know, you're, you're familiar with it, it's just worth saying that it is a very dense urban city, and we have, uh, population of about 850,000 uh, in an area of 50 square miles. So if you can do the math, that's uh, 125 square kilometers, maybe. We have a very large commercial sector, high-rise uh, office buildings, and a lot of businesses. We have uh, many people commuting into the city, a couple hundred, two, three hundred thousand a day. Uh, we have uh, couple hundred thousand tourists a day, or 16 million a year. So there really are well over a million, actually oh, around 1.2 million people in the city every day. So that's more of a representative population. Uh, two thirds of our discards are actually not from the residential sector. And also as a dense urban city, uh, we think of ourselves as more like a European city with two thirds of our residents living in apartment buildings, six units or more maybe 9,000 apartment buildings, and uh, very multicultural, multi-ethnic, uh, people from around the world, more than half the people actually having English as a second language. So uh, we're quite a, a cosmopolitan challenge. So uh, the thing about, uh, we have a long history of resource recovery. Uh, there's sort of an ethic in San Francisco on that. We actually had uh, people primarily from Italy uh, coming into the city. Uh, back in the 19th uh, century and uh, early 20th century and driving around and, and just uh, scavenging what they could uh, and uh, there were all sorts of people kind of competing for materials back then uh, but, but eventually they organized into associations and they got a law passed that would give uh, exclusive permits to be able to service different areas of the city. And that's evolved uh, to the situation we have today where we have a, an exclusively permitted service provider that is actually a monopoly uh, that we regulate. And so we have a, an arrangement that's been actually very helpful for us in terms of having a long-term service provider that we've been able to 
uh, regulate and, and bring around and being uh, helping this uh, the vision for zero waste. So I want to give a, that's part of the background. And the other part of the background is, is what has been a, a driver in California. Uh, California is leading the U.S. in waste diversion and recycling. And the primary reason is it's not the economics of expensive disposal, because it's actually cheaper in California than uh, many places, for example, in the East. It's really public policy and the vision that uh, has been embodied there. So with the, back in 1989, a law was passed that mandated all cities and counties to divert which is this kind of combination of recycling and diverting away from landfill, 50% of all discards by the year 2000. And uh, this was, a lot of states, like where I kind of came from in Massachusetts, had set goals that didn't have the teeth that this law had and the accountability this law created. So this required cities and counties to report to the state, do, uh, do plans, measure what they were doing, uh, otherwise they, and, and making progress toward it, otherwise they could be fined $10,000 a day. This law was taken seriously, and as a result, there was a, a tremendous public and private investment in creating the infrastructure for recycling and composting. And the state went from about a 10% diversion rate, uh, not including some incineration that was going on at the time, in 1990, uh, and by the year 2000, a little after 2000, the state passed 50%, and now it's in the, in the 62, 64% range uh, statewide, largely due uh, to that, that policy. Uh, so when, in San Francisco, uh, we were expanding our source-separated collection programs, building on our history, and we were doing recycling. We started uh, composting in the uh, late 1990s, and we, uh, we had to do that to help achieve 50%. And so then shortly after 2000, we were able to document that we had achieved 50%, and that's as far as the state level went. We said, okay, well, is that our final goal, 50% diversion? What we saw was the amount of discards with all the new products coming into the marketplace was increasing the entire, quote, waste stream. And so even though we were 50% diversion, the amount of landfilling even was going down, but not by that as much. So we realized we, we wanted it to go further. And how far do we go was the question we were faced with. Because there was a commitment in the city for being as sustainable as possible. There had been a whole public planning process around sustainability, and a sustainable plan was developed, including many different areas. And it was looking at how can we reduce our environmental footprint, our carbon footprint, how can we sustain a local community as possible. So this was an opportunity to do that. And so we were thinking, well, how far do we want to go? And we go to 75%, that's ambitious, we think we can do that. And, and neighboring jurisdiction across the Bay has set that goal, so okay, we'll match them there, but we should go further. And at the time, this was back in 2002, when we were going through this process, we were looking at models and visions, and there was actually a, this relatively new zero waste movement uh, that was starting to catch on, and it was sort of a radical notion. So a lot of the people in the, in the waste management recycling field thought, well, that's kind of crazy. How can you have you no know, waste? And it's like, well, you strive towards this goal, and you see how close you can get. It's not about having no discards, it's about utilizing everything. And we thought, well, that's a, that's a pretty good vision, because if if we're not for zero waste, then how much waste are we for? Do we have a goal of wasting 10% ultimately and we think that's we've achieved everything we need to? Because we recognize that wasting is a, is a symbol of inefficiency in the economy. And in order to move forward to a sustainable economy, we can't just keep extracting non-renewable resources. We need to move from that linear economy to a cyclical economy. And how do we do that? And so zero waste provided that great vision. And uh, so now I'm going to shift to talk about San Francisco's zero waste policies. There's a city hall. So what we did was we set the goal for 75% by 2010. This was in 2002. Some of that is ambitious, but that seems doable. And then we thought, okay, let's just be totally audacious and let's see if we can get the politicians to agree to adopt a zero waste goal. And at first I said, okay, well that's so 
far as saying being you know, totally sustainable, we'll just not put a date on it. But we were working with the policy commission and the main guy who helped fund the, uh, found the Rainforest Action Network, Randy Hayes, he said, now come on, you can't have no date. It'd be like saying, let's reduce climate emissions but have no date on it. You know, Kyoto Protocol, whatever, no date. I said, you're right, okay, you have to have a date. And I said, well, well, 2025, 2030. So that's too far politically. It won't mean anything. You've got to have it sooner. So that's how 2020 was spent. It's, you know, it's not like we came out with a careful plan and said, okay, this is how we get to zero and we can do it by 2020. But I think a lot of planning is like that because part of it is being captivated by a vision. You can end up debating, can you get to exact zero and when can you get there? And how can you prove it, whatever, scientifically? And then you never set the goal and you just end up spinning around. And we've seen, uh, and not just in San Francisco, but elsewhere, because this movement has really caught on in the last 10 years. We were the first in the US to do it with a date, kind of more seriously. And now there are many communities uh, in the Bay Area and around the US and around the world, hundreds of communities that have adopted this goal. And not only adopted the goal, but done a lot of planning and really moved far. So when we set this goal, we were at 50%. So uh, we, well, before that, the other part about zero waste was not just about Zero waste of landfill, and I said this incineration, and I'll explain that. Uh, but it was about, well, what's the purpose of this? It's about utilizing the, the, as much of this discarded resource as possible. So it's the highest and best use of resources. It's about redesigning materials so that they can be, we can reduce the amount of resources going into them, the amount of waste. We can reuse, we can recycle, we can compost or digest. And it's actually based on this highest and best use is why we don't, uh, incineration is not part of the zero waste goal. Um, because it is, in that linear system, if you're burning material and you're destroying it, even if you're getting some value, but it turns out to be a small fraction of the embedded resources in it, and you have to go back to the beginning and keep extracting resources to replace those products, then that is not a cyclical economy. In that realm, one of the reasons that one of the, the hooks that we were able to get policymakers to adopt this goal <clears throat> was helping them visualize this uh, embedded resources. We, we did the research and we found that the database in the US was that for every ton of material that we're discarding to replace that ton of material, the resource extraction production process was generating over 70 tons, 71 tons on average of waste is generated upstream in the product life cycle for every ton that's being disposed. So, okay, so then we're only looking at 170th of what we see at the local level. So we figure, oh, what is, this is like looking at just the tip of the iceberg. So we actually had this image of the iceberg and, and, and it's a good image because it re relates to other things like climate change, right? So we said, we're dealing with the tip of the wasteberg here, and we need to go to zero to help impact the whole global economy environment by reducing all that waste. And all that waste, 70 times that's generated upstream, represents a lot of energy use and a lot of pollution, including climate change. So that was a very uh, compelling image for policymakers. So this is the policy framework, highest and best use, and it also, we knew it was more, we didn't want to just make it look like, okay, now government's going to take care of it, we're going to design these good programs and everybody will participate and we'll get there. It really is, it's a shift in the culture and it's about everybody helping to make it happen, everybody taking responsibility. So we talk about in our policy the need for greater consumer and producer responsibility. Consumers and what they do with what they buy and how they deal with the material, where they put it, where they how they separate it, and producers uh, critically in that they are right now involved in designing and marketing products and then they sell them and then the consumers left with whatever they do with it and they don't really typically take any responsibility for making sure that product can be recycled or reused, composted, and that's a, a major problem. So consumer responsibility was seen as a critical piece because there were materials that presently can't be reasonably economically recycled and composted. 
So to summarize, that's the policy, and uh, we'll tell you how we, what we're doing, but we were able to uh, meet our 75% goal using the State of California methodology for measuring diversion that was created for the 50% law, which looks at everything that was being landfilled in 1990, so, and that includes residential and uh, con commercial waste and industrial, uh, but everything that was being, being uh, landfilled, uh, and what can we show that we were, being, we were diverting. Uh, and so we got to 80%, uh, and uh, that, more importantly, is reducing the landfilling, which we've had in, in the last uh, 10 years. So now let me just show you a little bit about, this is an example of the highest and best use on, on regarding food, which is an area that I have focused a lot on. We tend to think, okay, well, let's just compost food. But a lot of food can be reduced. Some of that food waste can be reduced, uh, looking on the supply stream. Some of the food is still edible. It can be fed to people, the best use of food. So we provide grants to agencies to collect food from wholesalers and retailers uh, that was still edible and feed it through 300 organizations in San Francisco uh, because hunger is an issue in the United States, probably and probably worldwide. Uh, so it helps meet that social need. And then uh, uh, some of this food, if it's uh, whether it, uh, special processed food like brewery grains and tofu waste, high in protein, easy to separate by processors or the produce from the uh, produce markets, we found that that could go into our agriculture uh, and help supplement animal feed. So we had farmers coming in and collecting uh, some of this material and it had enough value that they would drive into the 50 miles into the city, collect it for free, bring it back and feed it to the cattle. Uh, there were industrial uses, a lot of the uh, grease being collected by companies to make products like tallow and animal feed. And then the city started a grease collection to make sure all of the grease was being collected. Uh, and that is going to making biodiesel. Um, so all of those have uses. And then finally composting, which is shown down near the bottom, uh, is still obviously very beneficial. That has the uh, opportunity to the wide range of materials. So these other ones are more uh, select. And at, the, and at the very bottom is disposal and incineration or landfill we both see as, as disposal of wasting that resource. So this overall strategy that we've taken for going to zero waste, increasing our diversion, has been implementing convenience source separation programs. And that's just is really the key to the success we've, success we've had so far and how to recover most of the materials. And uh, that's been you know, convenient. And that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, more at length. And then as part of that effort is extensive public outreach and education. Uh, and also key is to get people to participate, to give them the incentive. I know it's a good idea. We want to be good community members, help the environment. But we, it's helpful to see that we can benefit economically. And this is particularly important in the commercial sector uh, to have that built-in financial incentive and for service providers to have an incentive. And then consumer produced responsibility, policies and enforcement, and also looking at how we improve our processing in the market. So let me illustrate that. So this is the, we kind of divide our uh, three streams. Uh, so what we've done is, is you know, in, in Europe, I see that there are often five or six streams, and I'm hearing that there are even 10 levels of separation in Denmark. What we had traditionally was uh, several sorts for recycling, and then uh, in the 70s, we started a two-stream recycling, all fiber and then remaining uh, containers, and that was sort of the standard of the U.S. And then around uh, 15, 10 to 15 years ago, we saw uh, the processing technologies uh, being able to take all the recyclables together paper and glass, plastic, aluminum steel in one container. So we experimented with that. We found that by going from two recycling streams to one recycling stream, we were able to boost participation and the recovery of material uh, by at least 20% uh, just by giving people one container versus two. More convenient, 
And there was there was a lot of debate in the in the recycling field. Well, isn't there's going to be a trade-off? You're going to have more contamination, lower quality. So being able to separate that very effectively, and you know we have been able to do that, but there was more residual. We think it is worth doing this. I think it depends on the markets, depends on the processing technology used, but that's pretty well established and proven. So it really is more about the specific markets. And I know that in places like Italy, where I just was, the recycling, glass recycling market is, is uh, a little bit different in the US. They're stricter in the standards, and they're insisting on a separate collection of that material. Uh, there's also more glass, because there's so much bottled, sparkling water being consumed in Italy, maybe here too. In the US, we're seeing more and more plastic, and so the glass is being put in with the plastic that kind of cushions it. So uh, collecting it, there's not as much breakage. Uh, but that's just, this is the, our approach, which has its benefits. One doesn't necessarily have to have all those materials in one stream. But we believe that fewer streams will in, in encourage more participation recovery. Then we have all our organics, food, plant, and compostable paper and fiber that would otherwise not be recyclable. Uh, actually can be compostable. And the beauty of composting is that anything that is organic that was alive uh, can be compost, which includes paper. So if you can't recycle paper, let's say it's uh, food soil, it's tissues, paper napkins, the fibers there are too short, they'll get washed out in the recycling process, coated papers. Uh, all of that can be part of the food collection, and much, much of that is already part of the food stream, so it, it can naturally go with that. And then we do have construction demolition waste as part of our system, and we count about maybe half of what's being recycled in the city because much of it was recycled before the state law went into effect. Uh, and then we have this remaining slice, and I know that looks more than one, 10 percent. It used to be bigger, now it keeps shrinking because we are taking uh, that uh, you know plastic CD, and more and more of these materials we're finding uh, markets for. Uh, but that's the the challenging range of materials that we are working to shrink. We like to say that of all the materials that we're accepting in our blue and blue recycling and green composting is at least 90% of all the discards. And that doesn't actually include plastic film bags, which there are markets for in separate collections. So if everybody did what we're asking them to do, we would be over 90% diversion. And then what, what about that remaining 10%? Well, that's the challenge of improving the processing and the marketing and telling producers you must produce products that we can recycle and compost, and we've taken policies, some policy steps in that direction. So just to summarize then, our basic collection system is simple, it's only three streams, and it's color-coded. As you saw, it goes in there. And so this is the, what we've learned in terms of education is that because we have so many languages and people don't like to read a lot, they just want cues. That the best, the most effective cues are pictures of what we want in there. So we tend to be very photo, picture-oriented of what we want. Uh, and you can see we've got all types of paper, bottles, you know, glass, aluminum, metal, plastic. And we've gone from over time from just accepting number one and two bottles to accepting all bottles to accepting all bottles and certain tubs and plastics to accepting all rigid plastics. And really the only reason we don't accept plastic film is because it's not compatible with the sorting system. Otherwise we would if it was clean enough. The film's tricky because a lot of times it's very dirty. Uh, but you can see there's that's a wide range of material and then what's not acceptable is limited and, and we're even having some special collections for those materials as well. And then the compostables, we mix it all together. There is a choice to just do a separate food collection and that is actually more standard in Europe. And there are pros and cons for that. Uh, but we wanted, there is some benefit of being able to mix the archers with food. And we, we didn't feel we could just tell everybody, you handle your own yard trimmings. We, we do have less yard trimmings, in the, in, if you notice that pie was only about um, 5%. Typically, it's more like 15 to 25% in the US. And so many communities can achieve way beyond 50% diversion without going after food. Uh, but that's why San Francisco, we needed to go after food. That was one of the reasons I came to San Francisco, because I said, ah, there's an opportunity to do food because they don't have enough yard trimmings. Uh, so our yard trimmings mix is, is relatively, is smaller. We have more food than anything else in that stream. 
And then this is what's left over, it goes to landfill. We now label these stickers landfill, not waste. And we actually have taken out the plastic film because we want people to recycle that separately. So we have fewer and fewer products that's left over. So your typical family, if they do the right thing, they're gonna have less than 10% of their material going into a, the black bin. And depending on the business, it can be you know, less than 10, less than 20%. So uh, that's sort of the basic structure. We actually collect a lot of the blue and the black have been collected in one truck. It's sort of more efficiency, a dual compartment. We have different uh, volumes there uh, for efficiency. The recycling uh, goes to, and that's their San Francisco, and part of the city of the southeast is a the recycling sorting facility. And this was a facility built over 10 years ago, so it was kind of the state of the art 10, 12 years ago. Now it's in, actually not. Uh, but it, we've, we've upgraded a little bit. But it's a, it's a simple system. A little bit hard to see what goes on here, but basically, in the beginning, you've got uh, Material going up conveyors, there's some pre hand sorting of larger materials that is not compatible for the screening. But most of the material goes over these screens you see on the right, they're spinning and they're elevated. <clears throat> and they do a very good job of all the paper materials going over this way, over the top. And the bottles and cans are falling through, and heavy materials are either going straight down or this way. So it does a very good job of separating all that out. What doesn't work very well is the film plastic much wants to either stay with the paper, <coughs> excuse me, or wrap around machines. But this is just a, you know, this is something that's been around for, you know, 15 years. It's just a, it's just a basic mechanical separating. And then after that, uh, we do uh, an optical sorting to recover a lot of the plastics. That's something that we recently added on a couple of years ago. Uh, there's still some more hand sorting. Of course, magnets pull out metal and eddy currents pull out aluminum. And we basically created about 16 different commodities there. So you've got aluminum, metal, several grades of plastic, a couple of grades of, of paper. Um, and so I'm just keeping this part short, uh, but just to give you the idea that it's, you know, it's, it's basic technology that you see around the world. And we create all these commodities where right uh, they become a commodity in the international marketplace. It's nice to be able to market new stuff locally. Uh, and we're moving in that direction. Glass has always been in the Bay Area. Uh, increasingly, plastic is. But for we were sending a lot of plastic overseas because that's where the best prices were. And it's interesting, you know, China was growing very fast. Still is, but 10 plus percent many years. And they had this they had a need for a lot of raw materials which they didn't have in the, in the country. They didn't have large forests. So they built all these mills, very advanced mills to take recycled paper, and they were paying the best prices in the world. And so <clears throat> the biggest exports uh, out of the Bay Area were uh, recovered paper uh, and, and metals, for example. Uh, so we're mining our cities. You know, we used to go overseas and, and mine and bring it back and manufacture. Now the U.S. economy has changed and we're mining the cities and exporting that material. China makes the products and it comes back. So all these shipping containers coming with Chinese products going back empty, so it was sort of a backhaul. Uh, so it's a bit of a big loop, but actually surprisingly efficient. But the more one can do it locally, the better. And we're moving it in that direction uh, with, with plastic paper. <coughs> So that's, that's just sort of the nutshell on the recycling, and we can talk more about it. Now I just elaborate a little bit on our composting collection. This is something that San Francisco was, was a leader in. Recycling was pretty standard in the U.S., but we were the ones who rolled out the largest food collection program in the U.S., and uh, still have the largest one in terms of an urban collection program. Uh, and also, we're kind of unique in the world in the, in the level of penetration we have. We started out uh, with the large produce, uh, producers and, and then uh, you know, wholesale and then retail, then we went food service, uh, and then on a parallel track we were starting in the single family households, and eventually we worked up uh, to multifamily, and now we, as I think I mentioned, we have a food collection in, in, uh, nearly 
virtually all our apartment buildings, 100,000 apartment buildings. So the, the basic strategy is we give uh, the a household, whether it's a single family or an apartment building, a kitchen pail, uh, just to help them think about putting it, their food scraps separately. Uh, they get uh, compostable bags, a, a sample of them. Uh, they, they're told they don't have to use uh, compostable bags. And this is an example where we allow, we, we're very clear about no plastic unless it is certified and labeled compostable. And bags are the main uh, example of that. Having a compostable plastic bag <laughs> helps the use of non, helps get stop the use of non-compostable plastic. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, these are the, to the two kitchen pails that we've used. Uh, we're mostly using the solid pail, <coughs> although this vented one on the right has actually become the, increasingly the norm in Europe. And there's benefits to that with the rebreathable bag. You actually have a lot of evaporation and, and, and less odor. Uh, the only really downside of that is that you are forcing people to have to use a compostable plastic bag and go buy that, or you provide them every year with a year's supply. That is something that we haven't done, we debated about it, and I will actually say that the evidence is that if you do provide people with compostable bags, and enough of them, you'll actually get better participation. So we may still do that, there's just, we just quite haven't because we've gotten, you know, relatively good participation without uh, providing those bags, but we want to keep improving that. So we actually say you can use newspaper, you can use cartons, or you can just put it in the in a container without any lining, and then you know you could be emptying it maybe every day or two, and you just wipe it out, wash it. That's what I do. Um, so that is the uh, options that people have for collecting the food scraps uh, for residents, and I'll talk a little bit more about business later. We have separate trucks that collect it. All our trucks are compacting trucks, which allows for you know space efficiency. Now you could say if you're collecting only food scraps by themselves, you wouldn't need to compact it. In some respects, not better not to. So actually some of the best collection programs in the world for food scraps, so let's say like Northern Italy, they're actually not compacting the food scraps. And it's all coming in, but they're collecting food scraps separately. But because we're collecting plant debris, and we're collecting fiber, including from stores a lot of wax cardboard that wouldn't otherwise be recyclable, there's a, there is a benefit to compaction. Uh, and so large generators, you know, we went to a lot of food establishments and they may have had one of these larger containers, like a two cubic yard, two, essentially two cubic meter bin, or a, like in this case, maybe a six to ten cubic meter compacting unit. And because if they, were, if they were a food business, most of their material that they're discarding is compostable, we just said, now we're going to take your main bin and make it your composting bin. We're going to paint it green because we're all about being color coded here. And then we'll just give you a small container for your residual because you don't need hardly anything. And you'll have all sorts of container for recycling. But what, on the commercial sector, there's a full range of options. The three bins that you saw earlier, those are wheel bins, and the standard size is 120 liter for a single family household. They can go uh, smaller down to a 80 liter for the, the black bin, uh, and they can go up to 240 or even 360. Uh, that would be rare. But each side, they, they pay based on that volume. So they're going to pay less if they go down and more if they go up. For businesses, they have those container sizes plus all sorts of others. And having many different options of container size and frequency help. So residents are picked up in a standard weekly collection. But businesses, particularly food businesses, will have more often up to daily. And apartment buildings will do more. So single family is set weekly. And that's going to be, we're actually moving to do the residual less weekly. Uh, which is uh, another good way to, to encourage participation. And then multifamily can be more than weekly, often two or three times. And then businesses, like a food business, can go up to daily. So this is what it looks like you, in a, for example, in a kitchen. We provide, the other thing we do is, okay, so they get provided their collection container you saw. But then inside, the key for success is, is efficient sorting. And particularly for a business, you're changing their operations we work with them to make it as efficient as possible. And so we look at where their people are actually doing the, the food prep or the food plate scraping, and we say, this is where you need to have the containers. And if you have the containers together, and very easy to see, green for compost and blue for recycling. Most people are not colorblind, and it's easier than trying to maybe read a sign. 
and the gray there is the residual, so just right there. And there's actually two green because most of what they're scraping is, is food. So that's the back of the house, and when we work with food establishments, we set the back of the house first. But then over time, we move to the front of the house. And even with uh, you know quick service fast food, that's where you have most of the front of the house. The front of the house is basically where your the customers are eating, and if they're eating on site, then they're, they're generating a lot. If, it, if the tables are bust, then that ends up going to the back of the house and there's good control. But if you're serving on, say, disposables or your customers are, you know, throwing away their remaining, then you need to have a collection system for the customers. And that is a more challenging realm. Um, but we've been tackling that with, with uh, greater success. And, and part of it is allowing businesses to customize the signage uh, and encourage them to, to basically use uh, less disposable foodware for one, but also you know, as much compostable foodware. Or in this case, everything that's plastic is recyclable. That's pretty easy to understand, all plastic being recyclable. Uh, and everything that's food and paper being compostable. And then you have just some products that are left over for landfill. And this encourages the business to do less and less than that because they're incentivized to do as much as possible. Uh, also, we have the uh, uh, example of using the actual objects, so the three dimensional uh, labeling. And here at this hospital, you'll see that most of the collection station is for composting because that's the majority. You know, four or three spots and then two for recycling and one for the residual. And this is a typical setup in the business. So not only do we have residents and food establishments doing the three stream, but we have all types of businesses. So we worked, we went into all our high-rise office buildings after they had well-established composting programs, and we said, now you're going to do, I mean, well-established recycling, now you're going to do composting. So we had the three streams there, and then we looked at the restrooms, and they have all these paper towels, right? Unless they have the you know, hand drying. Hmm. Well, paper towels. They're really better for composting and recycling, again, because of the fiber. And so in that case, it's virtually all paper towels. We just said, OK, put a sign on saying, only paper towels <coughs> for composting. And then if you need something for you know, sanitary napkins or something, that often can be put in the, in the stalls. Uh, and so we're easily then capturing all the paper towels out of the restrooms for composting as well. So um, you know, with, with this way, you're able to get uh, buildings to be uh, you know, over 70, 80, even 90 percent diversion. And then special events were originally one of the hardest areas to get people to recycle. Uh, but we actually found that because most of that is sort of food, working with the food vendors to use compostable foodware, and because we allowed compostable plastic if it was certified and labeled properly and can be identified, that also uh, helped. And so now it's been standard for many years that all the, all of the special events have to have this through stream system as well. Well, good labeling there, and actually, if you have monitoring, that even helps. Uh, and the most recent example is the one up in the left there. That's the America's Cup, which was uh, quite an event. But they were very committed uh, to do high diversion, and they were in the, ended up being a high 90% diversion, very close to absolute zero waste. Uh, and they even had a thing where the, they were on port property, which is the you know land around our, the bay, the port. The port passed a policy saying that you cannot, use, for these events, cannot sell bottled water. There's too many bottles and it's waste. We had really good, clean tap water. We want you to use tap water. And so then they would actually have these stations of tap water. And then you could either have a, a cup was provided, but often they will sell these nice reusable bottles. But actually, it's becoming more and more the norm that people are bringing their own bottles with them. So then they can just be, have a nice refill of clean water. And it's actually healthier water. It's regulated clean Sierra mountain water versus bottled water that may be shipped around the world where about a third of, you can fill a third of that water with oil and that's how much energy goes into providing that water. <laughs> um, so these are some of the resources. We, we basically have that free stream collection but we also have special collection for various materials. We've worked with take back for, for batteries and, and, and paint uh, and uh, various materials that are hazardous that we don't want the landfill to provide special collection. A resident can sign up for bulky item collection. And um, so all of that is to be accessed on the internet, where people can bring things, how they can get it picked up, customized sign making. Uh, so this is part of the tools that we provide. But the, the biggest tool that we provide people is direct targeted outreach. 
And, and really, ultimately, what's most successful in getting people to do what you want them to do is to talk to them, to be able to look them in the eye and have that face-to-face -face conversation, be able to answer the question, be able to go into their business and say, well, I see what you're doing now. What about if we have, you know, you're recycling your composting container here and, and, and figuring that out. Now, we don't have walked into everybody's home and done that. Uh, initially, this program was sort of automatically rolled out to all the single-family households. We did phone calling and mailing. But over time, we've done more and more campaigns where we have gone door to door and talked to people. Or we've, uh, as you see in the lower left there, we've actually looked in someone's bin uh, and you know the drivers are doing this to a certain extent, but we don't want to rely just on the drivers. We're all about how fast they can collect. But if we see that they're not doing it right, we'll leave a nice little tag explaining what. And now that tag has evolved with just pictures. And, you know this item here shouldn't be in the black; it should be in, in the green. Um, but then there's the opportunity to follow up <coughs> and actually have a conversation uh, with that resident. So. You can say, well, this isn't this just all so intensely uh, labor intensive. It, it is to a certain extent, but uh, you know, if you're if you do these campaigns periodically and say you target a neighborhood and you do multimedia in that neighborhood, from bus shelter signs to internet, to going and knowing that they may know that you're going door to door, uh, and then maybe have a competition between neighborhoods saying, you know. Who's going to be recycling and composting the most? And though that neighborhood that does will get an extra prize, that your community center will get a grant. Uh, you know, various strategies. But we've actually, there was a job training money from the federal government a few years back. And we, we took that money uh, and we hired people from disadvantaged neighborhoods who uh, were economically disadvantaged, were unemployed. And we trained them in our programs and they became our ambassadors and they went out. And so now we have people who are from different neighborhoods in the city, representing different cultures and different languages, who can go into that neighborhood and be speaking, uh, say, Cantonese, which is the second most common language in the city, or Spanish, or Vietnamese, or Russian, or Tagalog, or whatever. And, and it, it really makes quite a difference. It's like, oh, my, my neighbor. Thank you. So that was all day, if you want to tell me. Uh, and, and, and on the, so that's sort of the generic outreach, uh, including residential. For businesses and for city departments, uh, we've had a fairly intensive approach in, in helping them set up these source separated programs. Uh, and essentially, you know, we often do presentations. Once we, once we, uh, we help them with, with setup, with multilingual training. So we've had a team of people who can speak different languages that will go in. Uh, and particularly when we were working with the food establishments, they'll have different shifts, two or three shifts, a lot of different languages, but they may be primarily a couple, and you make sure you have those languages and that you do good training, and that you also train the managers to then be training people in the long run and be part of the job. Monitoring, audits, before and after, uh, good, good setup with signs and stickers, good feedback. I mentioned incentives earlier. I think a structural thing that's very advantageous for us, and history shows, especially in the, in the U.S. and beyond, that if people are having to pay for the service based on their level of use, it's a direct feedback. It's sort of like, imagine if you were trying to get everybody to reduce their electricity use, they didn't pay for electricity. So you, would, you couldn't use any of the economic incentive. It was part of the taxes, it's disappeared. So we really like to say this is like a utility. If you're, if you're paying, and I'm assuming in Copenhagen here, people pay separately for electricity or gas or water, certainly for phone, right? You know, I mean, you know, imagine if you didn't have to pay for your phone, it was part of your tax. <laughs> you know, so that is, I think, an important principle and uh, gives you that ability to direct, direct feedback. But in order to be able to do that, you have to have service provided directly to that resident or business. You can't just have, say, a street collection container where people walk anonymously and dump materials in there, and you don't even know who just contaminated it. So if you're collecting at the, at the point of generation, at the curbside or door, door to door, then you have the ability for direct feedback and direct monitoring. And uh, history shows from a lot of studies that you get much more effective uh, participation recovery and all that with that direct service. So basically, they're paying for the trash going to uh, landfill. 
businesses actually pay for all three streams and get a discount based on the version. And the other thing is that not only do the generators get an incentive, but the service providers too. And as, as I may have mentioned, we regulate, we, the city regulates these rates that are charged, and these, regu these rates are not charged, the city is not billing the customers, the service provider is. So we have a permanent, exclusively permanent service provider that has that natural monopoly, the ecology companies, they provide the containers, that's their little logo on there. Uh, they have now a new one. They used to be called Nortel Waste Systems, and then eventually they rebrand themselves as Ecology Waste Zero because they really were embodying the zero waste uh, message and, and goal. Uh, but they, we basically set their profit margins, and their profit margin is based on them achieving tonnage reduction goals and percent diversion. So every year they have a set of four goals they can achieve, and for each goal they achieve, they get another half percent profit. If they get all four, they're getting five to six million dollars additional profit. That's a motivator. They personally are as on, totally on board as zero waste, but having it completely tied to the bottom line really makes a difference. And there are different ways of doing that, but our system allows it to be done very well. It could be done contractually, but I think that's an important component. So uh, our programs are voluntary, provided with a lot of outreach and assistance and financial incentive until four years ago when we said, okay, now that we've rolled these programs out, we know we can do it everywhere, we're kind of leveling off a little bit with, with participation, now it's time to make it mandatory. Uh, the option, of course, is if you're rolling out a new program, is to make it mandatory right away. And that is a reasonable approach as well, and you see that a lot, you know, especially in Europe. Uh, but we didn't do that, and so maybe politically, it's easier to sort of show people what can be done and say, now it's the law. Uh, but everybody has to have uh, adequate service, property managers have to provide it for their tenants. This was a main reason because we still had a lot of property managers that didn't want to bother putting the service in and having asking their tenants to do it. So now they have no choice. And uh, this was the way four years ago that we were able to, because it was an opt-in for the apartment buildings, we now made the opt-in mandatory, but we go in there and say, now that you have to do it, why don't you let us help you, help you in implementing this program? and we'll even go door to door to your tenants, provide them with a kitchen table, for example. Uh, but the bottom line is that everybody, all residents in the city, all businesses, all visitors, have to do this three stream separation. And uh, this is an example of just of a lot of the uh, outreach that we've done. Uh, a, a lot of, we'll do rolling campaigns in different neighborhoods, that's a bus shelter on the left. Uh, and that says, we compost in Richmond, so the Richmond is one as a neighborhood district in the city, uh, because we want to be better than the sunset, and that's an adjoining. So we're getting some competition there. Uh, and then you know, there's something you know, toss the toss the leftover broccoli. Healthy competition can be good for the planet. Um, and then you have you know, when you're through with the apple, we love the core, <coughs> and so forth. And you know, here's on the right facing the aftermath. Oh my God, we got this party. Uh, but like, you know, it's a recycling moment. So they're just, you know, <laughs> clever outreach campaigns that can be done. Um, okay, so that's, that's the collection. Now I'm going to just touch briefly on the processing. Uh, there's lots of composting technologies out there. They generally keep improving. Uh, in California, you've gone from a kind of a lower tech, open windrow, open pile, trim pile approach. And then with food, uh, it's becoming more common for that to be a, a covered pile with forced aeration. Uh, so you pull the air through the pile, for example, and run it through a duct system and biofilter to filter sort of the emissions to reduce uh, the volatile organics uh, and then maybe a little bit of methane that might be there and, and help clean it. Uh, but this is a 15-acre site that does about 400 uh, tons a day. So our, we're, we're, our composting collection now has, has gone to over 600 last year or so, a couple of years, it's been uh, over 600 tons a day. So we're collecting over 600 tons a day from residents and businesses of mostly food scraps. It's going to one of two compost facilities. This is one of them. And uh, essentially the approach here is pretty straightforward. Material comes in and uh, we actually have these long haul trailers. We don't have space in San Francisco, we just have like, no space. Uh, and you know, doing, uh, if we had a composting facility in the city, it would have to be, as like a lot of facilities I've seen in Europe, a fully enclosed, completely enclosed building under native aeration, everything like scrubbed. 
and you know, if you're gonna be right next to a residential area, that's a good way. Although I've seen plenty of couples, even outdoor composting facilities near people. If composting is managed well, it has very little odors, but it's very easy to not always manage it perfectly. And food makes it more challenging because it's, it's so volatile that it makes it fast. So we, we hold 22 plus tons in these trailers uh, to a regional comp these regional composting facilities. And the trailer comes in, it gets mixed, basic shredding, uh, screening, <coughs> and then the opportunity for the large pieces to be for some sorting. This looks pretty ugly. Uh, this is an example. I like to use this to tell people, you know, presenting in San Francisco, this is why we don't want you to put non-compostable plastic in the food. Look what you're making somebody do. That's not very nice. Mm -hmm. you pull on the, um, they try to pull out as much of the plastic up front, and then they, they do a lot of screening at the back end. But, you know, it's, it gets shredded. It's not unusual. If you look in the finished compost, you you find a little bit or two of plastic, and you try to act, minimize that. Uh, so basically, this is a forest aerated system. It goes through a biofilter that reduces VOCs by 90%. And over time, they've gone from a 60-day active high temperature process to a 45-day, and now they're really moving to a 30-day. So they're finding ways to be more efficient. High temperature active composting, pathogen kill, uh, it becomes stabilized. Then you go through a curing period, depends on how stable you want the product. You then screen it down to uh, typically one quarter to three agents. I forget what that is in millimeters, uh, but a nice fine product. And then the, the, and it's very nutrient rich because of all the food scraps. So compared to just a landscape breed compost, food scraps has a, a hot, much higher NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and, and a lot of micronutrients and, and very uh, vibrant compost. And the key that the marketing, so they market this compost, and they, what they do is they have a soil scientist that works with different farmers. This is a certified organic compost into the organic agricultural market. And they work with farmers to figure out what do the soil need? What, what's, your, what's the recipe of amendments that you need? And they do custom blending, often adding in like gypsum, lime, uh, sawdust. And then that is, goes uh, to various markets. There's landscaping, like golf courses, but the biggest market is agriculture. Uh, and the biggest part of the agricultural market, there, there's produce farmers, but is, is the vineyards. Over 200 vineyards are using the compost from that one facility you saw. And you've heard of Napa Valley, right? <laughs> well, um, a large percentage of those vineyards, Napa and Soma, 200 of them, are using the compost. And um, they basically spread the compost out between the, the wine rows and for growing cover crops. And this just makes for much more robust, healthy cover crops. Those cover crops are pulling nitrogen uh, out of the atmosphere. Uh, nitrous oxides are actually a pretty potent greenhouse gas. Carbon out of the atmosphere, bringing the carbon down deep into the soil with much deeper roots, uh, making for much healthier soil. And they're seeing much more vibrant, healthy grapes. Usually it takes five years from going from kind of a depleted vineyard if, if they do the right practices to get the ultimate production. And that five-year process is now shortened to a year or two, let's say two years with this compost. And so once they start using results, all these farmers, they want it. And they'll, they'll, they, they really want it. And they're like a completely secure customer going, going forward. Uh, so this really makes a sense. And, and so what we have here then is these, these vineyards and these uh, produce farmers making, uh, using this compost. This guy on the right, Niles uh, Walker, he showed me, you know, years ago when I visited his farm, he showed me this box, these uh, tomatoes that were like the size of a grapefruit. He said, we never grew such big tomatoes. They don't even fit in the box anymore. It's not that amazing. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, they basically are bringing this produce back into the city. Uh, there, there a lot of restaurants, high-end restaurants serving organic produce or serving produce that's grown with the compost, farmers markets. And so we have this nutrient cycle loop. And uh, this really uh, is why this is the biggest benefit of organics. More than taking out of the landfill, but taking out of the landfill is important because one of the worst things to put in the landfill is of uh, food because it's breaking down, creating methane and leachate. I know you're not doing much landfilling here, but does burning food make a lot of sense? Seventy percent water? That doesn't make a lot of sense. You're not going to end up using more energy than you get. Uh, and there's so much nutrient value. So you have all this organic and nutrient value that we're returning to the soil. The only way to have sustainable agriculture and landscapes is to return organics and nutrients to the soil. 
Otherwise, what we're doing is we're, we're just taking from the soil without replenishing it. And organic agriculture totally depends on this. And soil depletion is actually a critical issue worldwide that very few people are aware of. We, uh, it's unbelievable how much soil we're losing. So we're going we're gonna to just be in deep doo-doo with less and less soil if we're not going to return it. So what critical need is to return We just need to be returning all of these organics to the soil. Um, and so that's why this is, is such an important thing. Now, with food scraps, because, thank you, uh, food scraps are very volatile. So when you compost them, you are losing some of that carbon just as so trustful as it's breaking down. So the best thing to do with food scraps is not just to only compost it. It's actually to digest the volatile food scraps, then compost it. And so when, by digesting it, essentially, that volatile carbon that you would be largely losing in the composting process, um, you capture as a gas. And so you do it, and composting is aerobic by definition, anaerobic digestion is anaerobic. And so then it's a contained process, and because it's anaerobic, instead of it being carbon dioxide that's coming out, it's methane, CH4. And so you, but you get some carbon dioxide because there's already oxygen in the pile. So you create a, you get a, create a biogas, it's a mix of methane and carbon dioxide, and then you can uh, clean it, and it's a very good energy source. So this is just, these are pictures of how we've, different ways we've taken, uh, we've been taking for many years now, a segment of our commercial food-rich stuff, which is pretty pure, and uh, just doing a basic grind screen and, and sending it to the regional wastewater treatment plant that had excess digestion capacity. So it's an easy way to have that food be digested without us making the investment back then of building separate digesters. Um, but our, and so you see the material just after it's been shredded and ground coming in there on the upper, upper right. Uh, they, they, this energy allowed this wastewater treatment plant that had a net energy demand. So they were digesting the sewage solids and getting gas from it. Uh, but with, with added food and other high strength waste, as I like to say, they now are producing more energy than this entire very large wastewater treatment plant produces. So they take the gas, they make electricity from it, they power the entire facility, and they sell the excess electricity to the grid. Um, so for us, uh, we think that if you're going to make the investment to source separate materials for the highest and best use, it's important that you keep that food scraps that you're going to digest it separately. So that's our plan going in the future for larger scale. And that's because once you have sewage solids, you can't meet the organic certification of compost. So we are looking at having our green bin food scraps separately digested. And a digester is actually going to be built at that, at that compost facility you saw. So that's in process. And then we're also going to be doing it in the city. And then we're looking at, uh, ultimately, how far will this take us with the source separation? 80% now, we want to get close to 90%. But we recognize that you can't get all the materials sort of separated. So we want to, we still see that there's enough organic material in a residual bin that we want to process that. So we've been experimenting that with a number of years and we're processing a portion of it that's going to expand. We're still evaluating different technologies in that realm, but we want to recover that organic fraction, which is mostly food that's still in the residual bin and digest that. But because that's less clean and can't go for the organic market, we might do that in a <coughs> sewage sludge at a wastewater treatment plant. And if there's excess capacity, that's actually a very economical way of doing that. And the best use of gas, in Europe, most of it's going electricity because of the feed-in tariffs and the incentives. And there's clearly a good benefit from that. But increasingly, our electrical grid has become renewable with more and more solar and wind. In California, it's over a third in San Francisco because of the hydropower we use. It's 40%. So if we use it for electricity, we just go from 40 to 100. But vehicles typically are running on petroleum, right? Our collection vehicles are running on diesel with 20% biodiesel. So if they switch to natural gas, which is a lot cheaper and burns cleaner, which they're doing, and they use the natural gas from the food scraps, then there's a, be a, a bigger benefit, carbon benefit. We have determined that we're collecting enough food separately now that if we digest it, we could run the entire collection fleet in San Francisco. So all the three streams from all the residents and businesses, all that collection can be done from biogas from food. It would be a carbon negative fuel. 
because this is food that is pulled out carbon from the atmosphere. So we really think it makes sense uh, from a sustainable strategy. Uh, I'm just gonna, I mentioned that we've had other policies. We banned uh, posting the phone styrofoam um, because it wasn't compulsory recyclable, it was problematic, many good alternatives. Uh, we've also banned uh, single-use plastic bags. Uh, we require them to reduce or recycle compostable. Uh, we have a construction demolition degree ordinance. We require, this is an open market, so we have many service providers. They have to register and only use approved facilities that recycle material. None of this can go directly to landfill. It all has to be processed. Now, ultimately, the strategy is going to be to be processing everything before any final disposal. I mentioned producer consumer responsibility. That's a leading challenging edge. So how close we get to zero waste will depend on how uh, we can re help redesign the stream. We just had legislation passed that we worked hard on in California that's going to make, uh, help us recycle all the mattresses uh, that are out there. It provides a, a funding mechanism for that. Uh, and finally, this is my last slide. Uh, you saw some of the processing facilities we have. Part of our strategy to get as close to zero waste as possible is to upgrade that processing and integrate it to be more efficient. And, and that includes processing the residual. So this is the latest vision we have. This is actually a facility that's in planning. Uh, and, and those of you who are into the cradle to cradle by William McDonough, his team helped uh, design that. So that's a William McDonough vision. And there's a lot of really cool sustainable stuff there. But this is a facility that will produce more energy than it uses, uh, along with fueling the whole collection fleet. And uh, there are just so many opportunities uh, towards going towards zero waste and benefits. The Ecology Company employs a thousand people, many of them who live in the city are employee-owned. Uh, there are many job benefits. Studies show that recycling uh, in the U.S. typically is 10 times more jobs than landfilling or burning. If you're getting into reuse, it's even more than that. Um, so we're talking about saving resources, energy, people, uh, many benefits going towards a zero-waste future. Thank you.